The Council briefing open at 6pm. I'd like to welcome members of the Public Gallery to the meeting this evening. Just for those of you who may not have been to a Council briefing before, this is the um, meeting at which Council members ask questions of administration on matters that will be um, determined at the next Tuesday night meeting, which is the Council meeting proper where we make the decisions. But we do have public question time at this meeting as well, so I'll, I'll invite you forward for that in just a moment. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And also just to note that we do have all Council members here this evening just with Councillor Harley running a few minutes late. So um, without further ado, we'll go to public question time and receiving of public statements. So there is no order, it's just whoever wishes to approach the microphone first. We do ask that you state your name, the suburb in which you live, the item that you're speaking to, and we do ask that you speak for just up to three minutes. So um, I'll call forward the first speaker. Mayor Cole, I've received one declaration of interest from Councillor Toppleberg in relation to item 5.9. It's a declaration of interest affecting um, financial. Uh, the applicant is a current client of Councillor Toppleberg's business. Councillor Toppleberg is not seeking to participate in the debate or remain in the chambers or vote on the matter. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. Um, now just to um, explain what will happen next, we do jump around a little bit with the agenda because what we do is we go to the items that were raised by members of the public gallery and in the order that they were raised. So that means that the first item that we'll be asking questions on this evening is item 5.2, which is number 60 to 62 and number 62A, Sheraton Street, Perth, change of use to unlisted use lodging house. Any questions on this item, councillors? Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Director of Development Services, just wondering if you could comment on the um, question about the extending the offence um, and some of the crime prevention through design principles that the person in the public gallery spoke of. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, I'll pass to the Manager of Development Design um, for this item. Uh, through the Mayor, uh, in relation to the issue that the applicant identified, it's, it seems to be in relation to the boundary fence, which is not subject to the application as covered by our Dividing Fences Act. There is an opportunity there for us to go back to the applicant before the council meeting to um, discuss whether or not they would be um, amenable to considering increasing the height of that boundary fence. Um, at the moment, it doesn't look as though it's at 1.8, so there's the opportunity to increase it um, without requiring the consent of the adjoining landowner. In relation to the designing out crime provisions, again, as that relates to the, des the boundary fence element, it's not typically something that would have been considered in the application. Um, in considering the designing out crime for this specific application, we would be looking at the issues related to the street, um, the way that the development presents to the street or to the rear access, um, not necessarily the, between the interface of the, two, the adjoining properties. Councillors, Councillor Gonczewski. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just through you to the Director or uh, relevant staff member, Judge Austin. Um, is, why does the acoustic report need to be revised? In the table it talks about that the acoustic report is deemed to comply, but in the condition it talks about a revised acoustic report. Is this a standard revision that needs to occur um, or is there something specific? Through the Chair, I don't believe that there's anything specific that needed to be amended unless there was anything changing. Uh, there was another condition that required the management plan to change slightly, so unless that resulted in something, but I don't anticipate that would result in any acoustic changes. Um, it may be that that's just part of our standard condition there, so we can just amend that um, before the council meeting. Thank you. Councillors? Councillor Toppleberg? Thank you. Just a question in relation to the management plan. Um, the management plan stipulates that the, um, the uh, premises will be rented out to staff and students of Youth with a Mission. Uh, does that mean that in the event, uh, in the event it is approved, uh, that any change to that potential occupancy for continued use as a lodging house uh, would only require a change to the management plan and therefore could be approved under delegation? Uh, 
passed in another way. If used with the mission wanted to run it, or anyone wanted to run it as a lodging house with no relationship to the current management plan, does that just mean the management plan needs to be changed, or do they need to submit a new DA? Through the chair, the way that the condition's been worded at the moment, condition 3.1, talks about the management plan being reviewed every 12 months and that being approved by the city, which would indicate that administration would be able to approve a modification to that. If it was proposing to change the way that the premises is going to operate based on what's been described, then it may be that we would need to bring it back to council if they wanted to amend that condition and the contents of that. We can provide some further information through the briefing notes to clarify. Councillors. Um, manager, I just have a question in relation to the, um, the heritage characteristics of the property and interesting to see this back um, and being, I'm, I'm not sure if it's under a lease arrangement or purchase by use for, with the mission, but I'm wondering if um, the city has had any discussions with the applicant around MHI listing of the properties. Through you, Mayor. At, we haven't yet, but we can certainly um, raise that with them prior to the council meeting, whether or not they'd be interested in listing them on the MHI now that they're intending to retain them and use them. That would be fantastic, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, thank you. That was all questions on 5.2, so we'll move on. The next item that was raised was 5.6. 5.6 was um, a very late report, so I'm not sure if everyone's had the opportunity to um, read it, but it's number eight, Moyer Street, Perth, change of use from single house to unlisted use, short-term dwelling, and this has... Um, been with the State Administrative Tribunal and it's a Section 31 reconsideration. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Question through you to uh, Manager. Um, just there were some comments from the gallery in relation to the uh, noise manage well, the, the management plan being retrospective in nature in that it only deals with events after they occur. Can we just get some comments from uh, the officers in relation to management plans for short term accommodation and uh, what? else could possibly be in a management plan that would not be considered retrospective, particularly in relation to noise, given some of the measures that have been proposed? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, there's, there's a couple of parts to this. The management plan largely deals with the actions that will be taken once um, an issue is raised, whether it's a, a concern about noise raised by a, a surrounding resident um, or the owner themselves become, becomes aware of it. Um, that is typically how the management plans, are, the requirement for management plans under the temporary accommodation policy the city has essentially requires that process to be set out. Um, it also requires the house rules and um, the code of conduct to be provided to each um, resident who's staying there before they, or when they arrive. So they understand the house rules around parties, around noise, etc. So um, that is a proactive measure that's taken. Um, in addition, this applicant has actually proposed noise monitoring um, devices to be installed in the property that would um, monitor the noise within the actual building, the level of noise. It doesn't record noise, it just monitors the level of the noise inside the property and um, within the alfresco area at the rear and at any point um, that a particular noise level that's set is breached they will be alerted electronically immediately and they'll then be able to make contact. So that is another um, semi-proactive measure if you like. Um, they are reacting to the noise but proactively have installed those devices to ensure that any noise above a certain limit um, is addressed immediately without having to wait for a complaint to be received. Councillors, <coughs> Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, just in relation to the parking in the uh, front setback area, a concern was raised around um, uh, cars parking in those areas along the street that actually overhang out into the footpath. Um, is the parking bay that is um, within the front setback area a sufficient size to accommodate you know, the reasonable range of vehicle sizes that would be expected to um, park within the, um, that bay? 
through you, Mayor Cole. I'll take that on notice. Obviously, the bays currently exist. There's no works um, proposed to the site as a part of this development application, but um, we'll take that on notice and provide some advice around A, the dimensions of that parking bay, and B, what the policy requirements are in this precinct. Thank you. Councillors, Councillor Hallett. Um, in the, the public gallery mentioned um, 430-odd Airbnb um, premises in Vincent, um, slightly more than what I guess we're aware of and monitoring. I'm just wondering if you could update us on the, what we've been doing recently around identifying these places and retrospective approvals and, and that kind of thing. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we have, whenever we receive uh, a complaint or uh, an inquiry from a resident um, who's being affected by um, a short stay accommodation, an Airbnb that's operating, um, we investigate that um, and we ask the operator to cease operation um, and to either cease operation and not commence or if they would like to recommence they'll need to wait until they've lodged their application um, and had that determined uh, and if it's approved they can then recommence. So that's our current practice. Um, we haven't put together a project and we haven't resourced that project to proactively go about reviewing how many Airbnbs there are, where they are, um, whether there are issues. Um, we are looking at putting together a project next financial year um, to review the policy um, that the city has, review the scheme provisions and, um, and then proactively address that issue following that. Councillors. Um, Director, I just wanted to ask you what you, um, what sort of level of awareness you have of the sound level monitoring system and the video communicator. For example, if there was a noise issue, is the video communicator um, able to be activated without the, um, res the resident or visitor staying in the house answering the call? For example, in terms of the communication, can it spontaneously happen or would the visitor have to activate the, the, the video communicator to actually communicate? Yes, through you Mayor Cole, the resident would need to um, press the button on the video communicator in order to then engage with uh, the owner or the property manager. Um, the, the, the management plan specifies that where contact can't be made with um, the owner, um, the property manager will then attend the site immediately. If the property manager is un unavailable to do that um, and the noise is significant, then the police will be contacted. So that's the, that's the process step by step that's been set out in the management plan. And again, I'm not sure how much you know about these devices, but is the um, sound level monitoring system able to be switched off by the visitor or is that um, something that could only be activated by the owner? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. I understand that only the owner can switch it off. Um, however, I'm not, that's what I've been advised. I haven't confirmed that myself. It'd be good to know if that's possible. Um, just going back to um, Councillor Gondoshevsky's question, just in relation to the um, Moyer and Brookman guidelines around um, car bays in the front setback area, um, if we could have the specific provisions um, included in the report and also if we could just look at how many um, houses actually have um, car parks in their front setback areas in the precinct, that would be very useful information. Thank you. Are there any further questions on this item? Councillor Vitakis. Through you, Nicole, I just wanted to, just another inquiry re, uh, regarding um, the noise detection device, device in the video communicator. Are we aware of anywhere else um, that um, these items are being used uh, to monitor residences and where that fits within um, um, privacy um, issues and protection of privacy of residences under the Residential Tenancies Act? Yes, Serena Mayor Cole, I can take that on notice, um, both of those queries, and we'll provide that information in the briefing notes. Any further questions on 
Right, okay, thank you councillors. The next item that was raised is 5.9, which is number 58 Kalgoorlie Street, Mount Hawthorne, single house. Any questions on this item? Oh, sorry, Councillor Castle, go ahead. I haven't had a chance to look at the report in great detail yet. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, to the Director of Development Services if you could just briefly tell us what's changed in the, in the uh, plans. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, I'm just trying to pull up the report. Um, the main changes that have occurred are at the rear of the property um, and relate to the stairwell being internalised, the removal of one of the bedrooms, um, an additional set uh, that results in additional setback from the eastern boundary to the rear. The change to the removal of that bedroom has been replaced with um, an alfresco space, um, a small deck, um, and as a result it's more open. Um, an assessment, the assessment that we've undertaken has shown that the setback to the south is also deemed to comply. That was the case previously but it also is the case um, now. In relation to the front of the building, the the size of the perforations on the upper floor have increased um, so they're, they're larger and there's been a window included behind those perforations, a circular window um, and residents standing within the bedroom at the front will now be able to see out of that, out of those perforations to the street. So there, it's probably just a summary of the main changes. Um, it is included in the report in the background, at the end of the background section from memory. So um, in relation to those changes to the front of the property, it really increases the ability for street surveillance from the property to the street, but not necessarily interaction from the street to the property. Would that be correct? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. There doesn't seem to be any additional interaction from the street to the, that bedroom through that window. So um, the perception of surveillance from that upper floor hasn't been increased significantly at all. Councillors. Um, Director, again, I'm having a bit of an issue with the resolution um, of the plans and trying to look at what the rear setback is now to the stairwell. Um, are you able to give a figure on that? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. The ground floor and upper floor setback from the dwelling to the eastern boundary is now 4.1 metres. It was 2.7 metres uh, with the, the plans that were deferred previously. And also, could you just talk us through the jelly window openings, which are the front window? Um, the report states that it's now considered a major opening, but it has that one-way um, appearance. Um, given that they, um, is it how is that how is it sort of calculated as a major opening? Is each individual element of the window calculated to be a certain size? I'm just um, wanting a bit more information about about the definition of that and major opening. Yes, yeah, through you, Mayor Cole. It, it does relate to the amount of um, basically the size of the window. I will provide an explanation of that in the briefing notes. Hopefully that will explain how the R codes work. So I think there's, there's about three or four different, different definitions that fly around in the R codes before, um, <laughs> before I can understand it. So I'll provide a summary of that and, then, um, and those definitions for Council in the briefing pack. I guess when I read it quickly this afternoon as a late item, it seemed to be suggesting that there's the total window size, but then there's a percentage of it which is permeable. Is that sort of how it works? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and just in relation to the number of um, outdoor terraces now, um, so I'm trying to find, there's so many different versions of the plans. Hmm. 
My understanding is that it's still got the terrace at the side, which the main bedroom, the master bedroom, opens out onto. And then the change to the rear is that the rear terrace is now smaller and um, the, there's the, the, there is, is it two terraces? The roof terrace and the terrace from the uh, master bedroom? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, there is a terrace from the master bedroom at the front. I don't think that's changed. No, that hasn't no. changed from previously. The terrace on the upper floor has been reduced in size um, at the rear. And there is now an internal terrace on the first floor at the rear as well. Um, and that's, that's been um, And that has the curved wall, which then also conceals the staircase is that correct that's correct okay all right thank you are there any other questions in relation to kalgoorlie street okay thank you the next item that was raised uh, was 5.7 which is 131 herald street highgate proposed change of use from educational establishment to medical center any questions council loden uh, through the chair, just um, the questions raised from the gallery, which were around um, the car parking uh, that the that is part of the the, uh, the strata but, and the body corporate there, and how people using those car parking would access that car parking and also access the building. If I've got the questions correctly, um, also secondly, a, a query around the parking policy that because given it's a non-residential use is this not a six versus a one car bay shortfall yes i think those with i think that covered it broadly i hope i've represented that accurately through the chair uh, so in relation to the vehicle access to the premises that's probably something we're going to need to take on notice to discuss further with the applicant according to the approvals that we have on record there are 24 bays available and they relate to the commercial premises and the applicants indicated to us that they would be part of the lease agreement for this site and have offered those up as part of the car, the car parking assessment. So we'll need to discuss with them to confirm about the access arrangements. If council was to approve the application then we can look at putting on a condition about the management um, for the access to those bays and also for access to customers into the building um, given that they've mentioned that there is a FOB access. In relation to the car parking assessment, so the way that we've interpreted it is that the application is for a medical centre. We believe that the pharmacy proposed as part of this meets the definition of a medical centre because it's part of the application and therefore hasn't been assessed separately as a shop because it meets the definition of medical centre. So the car parking assessment that's been provided in the Port is based on the total floor area of the ground floor being medical centre, including that pharmacy. And the approval conditions that have been drafted relate to the entire um, ground floor area being used for medical centre and the hours of operation being tied to each other so that they can't be used independently. Councillors? Councillor Murphy? So, sorry, so can I just ask... So if there isn't a strata approval for a change of use or development application, then the applicant can still apply? Through the chair. So the applicant has the consent of the landowner for that strata tenancy. And because the use relates to the change of that tenancy and under the Strata Titles Act you own from the floor to the ceiling, alterations to that internal footprint don't require the approval of the strata. They only require the approval of that strata owner, which the applicant has obtained. There is perhaps a question because the application as proposed does show a lift, a proposed new lift at the rear of the building, which would be outside the strata tenancy and potentially on common property. So we can get some advice um, and provide that in the briefing notes as to whether that component would require the approval of the strata. That um, for the purposes of the application as presented to Council, we're not proposing to consider approval of that lift. Councillors, Councillor Patakas, sorry, um, Councillor Harley. Sorry, um, through you Chair, and just to follow on from um, Councillor Murphy, um, 
my question again relates to approvals from the strata um, body because it has arisen quite a lot um, over, the, over the time I've been on council um, and obviously can create a lot of tension. So my question also relates to um, about how we can do any approvals um, in regards to an area which may form part of common property or even um, look at approvals which talk about car parking which may also form part of common property um, ownership. So um, when will, will you be able to get that advice in time for next week's briefing? And between now and then, um, is administration able to have a look back on how we've treated similar matters like this before for consistency? Through the chair, yep, we should be able to provide that information as part of the briefing note. Um, maybe not by the. Excuse me, um, through you, Mayor, some of those examples are likely to be sitting within um, applications for short term usage, um, Airbnbs, et cetera, et cetera. Through the chair, yes, we can certainly look into some previous approvals to see how we've dealt with this issue. Councillor Fatakis, you wanted to ask a question? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was just getting some clarification on the calculation of um, and referencing to, to car bays. Um, and we're talking about, um, and also want to get some clarification on um, what is uh, what is being um, assessed at the moment, whether it's the stage one development or the stage two. Um, so firstly on the stage one, um, the chart um, actually refers to a five bay shortfall of 29 needed and only 24 provided as far as st stage one um, and then in uh, condition 4.1 it refers to one base so I just want to get it clear as to really what the difference um, is there and stage two um, refers to 48 needed there's 24 base shortfall so um, really in consideration of this um, really what's the implication for for us also considering a development that we know there's a 24 base shortfall um, with a stage two impeding. Through the chair, so the first table that's provided under the detailed assessment, that's based on what the applicants applied for. So that relates to stage one being developed with seven consulting rooms and retaining the educational establishment at a reduced scale on the upper floor. And then their stage two proposal is to convert the upper floor to a consulting room. So on the ground floor and upper floor, they would have a, tw a total of 12 consulting rooms, which would require 48 parking bays. The second table that's provided on page 10 of the report follows on from the officer's assessment that concludes that the proposal from the applicant of stage one, uh, of the complete development being ground floor medical centre and upper floor medical centre is too intensive for this site given the shortfall in parking that it would result in and also the fact that this is a residential zone and the impact of this potential land use in that area. As such we developed uh, or we've proposed that if council wanted to consider, consider supporting this application we would recommend support at a reduced scale and that's reflected in the parking table on page 10, which proposes stage one ground floor medical centre with six consulting rooms and the upper floor educational establishment reduced to the scale that the applicant had proposed. We've reduced from the applicant's proposal on stage one, seven consulting rooms down to six consulting rooms to reflect the fact that they only have 24 bays on site and with the six consulting rooms and the educational establishment, this would result in a requirement for 25 bays and would only result in a one bay shortfall. And administration's view is that that would be a more appropriate scale than what had been applied for. So what was the um, uh, applicant's um, view on that, uh, that revisement? through the chair we haven't been able to get in contact with the applicant to discuss the recommendation. Councillor Toppelberg. Just for clarity, just back to the um, strata question. So I understand what you say about floor to ceiling in the strata but my understanding is that because they are relying on things such as visitor parking which are outside of that and they don't have exclusive access to, so the 
the Form 1 clearly has been signed by the owner of the strata that they are intending to occupy for the use, but the ancillary result, so the, the car parking, etc., which from my understanding and certainly from the, the representation we've had the, here this evening, would require the approval of the strata of the uh, residential units, but we don't require that that approval prior to the submission of the application. I've got subsequent questions as well, but just want to get clarity around whether the strata, the, the requirement for the Form 1 is only for the uh, use itself or if it covers all land which needs to be form part of the application, which would include the car parking. Through the Chair, it's been brought to our attention now that the parking bays appear to be common property, in which case that would require uh, more than just the strata tenancy owner's approval. Okay, I can, well, I can send to withdrawal or a uh, deferral coming next week. But anyway, the other question I have is we clearly there's uh, some concern from the strata of owners who would uh, likely have to provide some level of permission, whether it be to even make the application or otherwise. And then we're also proposing to potentially give an approval for a an, in an intensity of the use that the applicant hasn't actually applied for, is that, I'm, I'm just curious as to what actually happens to the DA, like they've applied for A and we're potentially going to approve or we're recommending approval for B without the knowledge or consent of the applicant who doesn't have the consent of the owner of their car base, is that something that we're even able to do? Through the Chair, the car parking issue has now um, raise an additional issue that we hadn't considered previously. So that's something that we'll need to go away and look into and, and may result in us requiring a little bit more time. In relation to the intensity of the development that the applicant was seeking, they had in their application indicated that they would roll out the proposal in a staged process just to see how um, successfully the development would take off and had indicated that initially they were only seeking stage one approval and if um, council is of the mind to approve stage two, then that would be favourable to them. So we believe that um, reaching this middle ground achieves what they would be seeking initially. And um, if, the, if approved and if successful, then they could come back to get the stage two approval. Okay, so my last question just relates to consultation. Uh, can we, the consultation uh, and location map only indicates the premises itself, can we get an indication of which properties were consulted in relation to the proposal? Just and also whether the proposed, whether the consultation included the proposed or potential stage two, uh, or whether it was just for the stage one, what went out to consultation. If we can get that as part of the briefing notes, please. Yes, we can provide that. Councillor Gonczewski. Um, just in terms of the proposed hours of operation, just in liaising with the applicant, um, I note from their documentation that was put forward after uh, consultation that they had talked about the pharmacy operating from 8, I believe 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. seven days a week, um, and um, which would appear, is, which is not in alignment with what has been put forward as a condition. Um, just, I guess, a question around um, their assessment of. Um, whether that is viable opening hours, um, because I guess if if it's not considered to be viable opening hours, um, or the hour, opening hours are considered to be need to be different, then I, I'm not sure we could call it an incidental use. Through the chair, just to clarify, do you mean the condition, the hours that have been conditioned might not be viable for the proposal? It's just that in the, in the applicant's documentation they've talked about the pharmacy having extended hours over and above what has been conditioned. Um, obviously the medical centre is going to operate at the reduced hours but the pharmacy was being proposed to operate at those extended hours across the weekend when the medical centre, like, sorry, when, when the clinic component of the medical centre was not running and I, I believe that, um, that if you're not going to consider the pharmacy a shop in its own right then Obviously that's the reason that the hours have been tied together, um, but given that the applicant in their most recent documentation have said that the, the pharmacy will operate at different hours, I, just, I would appreciate some confirmation that that has been raised with them um, and is considered to be still a viable proposition. Yeah. 
we'll come back um, in the briefing notes with the response to that. Councillors, Councillor Harley. Um, so one further question that follows on from um, what Councillor Topperberg raised in regards to um, consultation. So I look forward to um, um, seeing a little bit more information on that. But my question relates to whether we are able to, or whether we already do, include um, other communities of interest, such as in this case the Beaufort Street Network, for for example, or other um, local um, community and business groups that you know are key stakeholders um, in in these areas. So if, if you could let me know whether they've been consulted or I'm not aware of anything in our policy that would preclude that, but if there is, perhaps you could let us know. Uh, we can come back to you in the briefing notes. We do currently send a list to a number of stakeholders each week of applications currently advertising, so we can confirm which groups are on that. And if they're not on there, we can add them to that. Councillors, um, Councillor Toppleberg, you asked most of the questions that I had. I just wanted to, this is just really a very, you know, getting down to the technical details, but given that we are, uh, it's recommended to Council to consider stage one only, I'm just querying that this should be a change of use from educational establishment to change of use to educational establishment and medical centre as opposed to whole scale change to medical centre. Um, very interested to know the applicant's views of just dealing with stage one. Um, also interested in the condition of the heritage building and the investment that's proposed by the applicant. Happy for those to be taken on notice. We can provide some responses to that in the briefing notes. Thank you. Are there any further questions on this item? Okay, thank you. Next item that was raised was 5.5, .5, which is number 351 Stirling Street Highgate, six multiple dwellings. Questions? Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Director um, or other staff. I'm just wondering if you could comment on the privacy issue raised um, in the gallery around the um, overlooking from, I think, the third story um, on the neighbouring property. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, the the cone of vision setback requirements of the R codes um, are met from those windows to ni number 99 um, to the side. Um, the bedroom window is more than three metres from that boundary in, in that location um, and the, the kitchen windows have both on both the second floor and the third floor um, have both been obscured so that um, there isn't any overlooking into those spaces. Councillors, um, just uh, Director, I did have, um, I think all council members received an email from a neighbour to the property who had some um, questions which I did forward through to you, but just for the record, um, this is the adjacent neighbour um, at 349 who had some queries about the street setback. Um, and talked about the fact that um, they were concerned about the impact on their um, primary outdoor area which is in their front setback and they were concerned about overlooking of the front courtyard area. Um, there was also a question around the southern boundary um, setback um, and concern over the reduced setback there and the issue has been raised around overshadowing of the property in particular solar panels. Um, there were some questions also around parking, um, which I think have been dealt with in the report. And also some commentary around um, the width of the land being 10.25 metres and that having an impact on the development itself, on the proposed development. Um, I did send that email through, so I'm happy for you to um, provide those questions on notice if you like. Or um, yes, through you, Mayor Cole, I, could, I can answer them now, I hope. Um, in relation to the parking and the width of the site, I understand the width of the site related to the parking as well as the overall design. Um, 
in relation to the parking, the applicant has increased the width of the bays to allow um, the turning movements to occur so, so the cars can turn into the bays and then reverse out. That's been assessed by the city's engineers um, and meets the Australian standards. Um, so though the width of this lot wouldn't typically allow um, 90 degree parking like is proposed under the building, in this case they've widened the bays to allow vehicles to move in and out safely and appropriately. Um, in relation to the front setback, um, the the deemed to comply setback standard, which is set by the city's built form policy for the five either side, is quite large as a result of uh, a building a few houses down, which is set back very significantly from the street. Um, I can't remember how many metres, but well over 20 metres from the street. The setback of this proposal is um, approximately the same as 349 Stirling Street, so the, the property next door. Um, it tapers away as it heads towards 349. Um, the setback of the balcony is greater than the setback of the front um, veranda of that building, and the setback of the building itself is greater than the setback of the building at 349. Um, the overlooking concern raised um, by the adjoining property um, into that front um, our fresco area that they have um, has been considered by the applicant. They've put up screening along um, that that side of the building and it actually um, comes around to the front as well so that there isn't any direct overlooking into that space, even though it's in the front of the building so it can be seen partially from the street. They've deliberately designed the balcony um, so that there isn't any direct overlooking. Um, in relation to the setbacks and the overshadowing of um, the solar panels, the applicant has designed the building deliberately so that um, the overshadowing of the solar panels is minimised. Um, the applicant is in attachment three, I think it is, um, the supporting information provided by the applicant. They've actually done, they've, they've drawn out and modelled the overshadowing um, throughout the year of those solar panels. Um, and as you can see, the only times the solar panels are overshadowed um, is in June, um, at lunch lunchtime and in the morning in June. Um, in the afternoon, there's always access to sunlight for those um, panels and for the rest of the year, um, during mid, from basically from mid-morning for the rest of the day, um, the solar panels have access to light, so it really only affects the solar panels um, up until around early afternoon in June. Otherwise, the rest of the year, there's no impact. Um, so they've deliberately, deliberately designed it that way. You can also see in that additional information um, the cone of vision, the, the overlooking um, that I was describing earlier in relation to the front um, balcony. Hope that helps. Thank you. And just in relation to the questions that were raised by Emily from 99 Broom Street, in relation to, um, I'll reread those to you. It was in relation to um, the second and third stories looking into the, the back of the property um, and the reduction of setback from 1.5 to 3 metres. I'm hoping I'm relaying that correctly. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, again, in the additional information, um, you can see for Unit 2 and Unit 5, the you'll see it in blue, the overlooking... Can you give us a page number, please, oh. Director? Sorry, I don't have the page numbers. I've only got the... OK, 252. You can see in blue the overlooking that's proposed to um, number 99. Um, in the case of the window from the bedroom, the bedroom window overlooking, um, that complies with the deemed to comply um, standards. It's set, it's set back three metres from that boundary. And the other windows from the kitchens have both been obscured, and so there, there's no overlooking at all from those windows. Thank you. Um, Councillor Toppenberg? So just, can I get some clarity about 
the questions from 349 Sterling Street and the alfresco in the front setback. I can't seem to see... I can see a two-car carport that's completely covered and I can see a front porch, but I can't seem to see any alfresco or any access to... Uh, yeah, I understand the question, but from what I can see from maps both above and at street level, the... 349 doesn't have any alfresco or any, uh, um, I mean it's got a front porch and a very narrow front garden because it's got the carport but I can't see any active space at the front of 349. Yes, through you Mayor Cole, I understand that the owner is referring to the front porch and the use of that carport. So it's not a specific alfresco area, my apologies for using that term, it's the, um, it's the front porch and they occasionally use the carport space as well, I understand. Councillors, any further questions on this item? Okay, thank you. We'll move on. Uh, the next item raised was 5.4, which is number 441 William Street, number 6 Brisbane Place, Perth, Mixed Use Development. Can I just query, is this, should this say hotel? It's described as a mixed use development. Uh, through the chair, uh, it's an application for a hotel, office, and restaurant. So, it so you're calling it, it a mixed-use development as a, as a mm. overarching definition? Yeah, we can amend that to okay. hotel. Uh, the yeah, the description for approval in um, under the recommendation says the development application for hotel, restaurant. And offer so that part would be correct. So that part's correct, but just the title. The description. Yes. Yep. yep. Okay. I'm um, sorry, Councillor Topham. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, just a question. Well, firstly, just confirmation. I know I had a conversation with the manager previously, but just to confirm, on page 110, uh, was there a replacement page issued? I apologise if it had been, but the cal the comment in relation to the car parking about the cash in lieu. Uh, said that the, the, the policy would arrive at a figure of 172,800. It would actually be uh, double that according to our policy because it's a vacant site. So just confirming that they would be in round, or it's uh, 300 and would be 345,600 dollars is the amount of cash in lieu that would be calculated on the site. Is that correct? Yes, through the chair, we have incorrectly applied the uh, cash in lieu contribution requirement and have neglected to note that the policy, the city's parking policy states that applications that meet the optional DAP threshold will be charged at double the standard cash in lieu rate, in which case that figure there which we'll amend prior to the agenda being published should actually be $345,600. Thank you. Um, there was an indication in the report that the applicant is willing to pay $50,000 in cash in lieu and that's very nice of them. Um, has there been any assessment by the officers as to whether 50,000, 60,000, 30,000, 345,000 would be the appropriate amount? It seems that we've accepted 50 as a, an amount that is appropriate because the applicant is prepared to pay it, but there's no comments specifically around uh, what parking and transport infrastructure could or should be improved in this area. And I also note that uh, William Street is slated to go two-way uh, sometime before we die, I think. Uh, it's only been on the agenda for about seven years now, but I, it's, it's supposed to be imminent, so I'm assuming that will have uh, some impact on the parking and access in the immediate location. So do we have any plans uh, or idea of what parking infrastructure could or should be, or transport infrastructure should be provided? Through the chair. Uh, through the assessment, we identified that there was sufficient on-street um, parking by way of um, public parking in the multi-deck parking facilities as well as some other at-grade parking facilities that Wilson has in close proximity. Um, the nature of the use where people will generally um, come by a taxi or ride share or public transport if they're visiting the city mm -hmm. and we're of the view that there is sufficient parking to waive the car parking requirement and therefore didn't believe that a cash in lieu contribution 
is required to offset that parking shortfall. However, that applicant, as you've identified, has offered to make a contribution to, of $50,000, which we believe would um, be beneficial in the area for upgrading the existing infrastructure that we have there and making improvements to that um, so that this land use or the other land uses aren't affected by as a result of this development. Okay, and you. sorry, um, just in relation to the uh, or the access um, in terms of the well, firstly, so the, the just so I understand correctly, the intent is to um, remove the uh, car bays that are um, uh, 2P or whatever they are at the front of the uh, proposed premises and replace it with a loading bay. Uh, but that that would not be for the ex uh, would it be for the ex uh, a, a loading bay as a designated loading bay or would it be a loading bay and five minute drop off bay um, what's actually proposed at, uh, on the William Street side through the chair so what's proposed is to remove two existing on street bays and convert that to a loading bay there is a condition of approval that will require the applicant to submit plans to demonstrate how that would be achieved and also to demonstrate that vehicles servicing their site can adequately manoeuvre in and out of that space and also provide details as to the required times for use of that bay so that the, the city can appropriately sign that um, which would then inform if it's a loading bay at all times or if it could be a five minute drop off bay at other times as well. It, we also note that the loading bay wouldn't be exclusive to this development and we have requested a condition that requires a loading bay management plan so that the applicant can provide details to demonstrate that they've um, suitably arranged all of their services at appropriate times to ensure that they can access that bay. Okay, and my last question relates to um, the waste management plan. So that's still intended to be collected from Brisbane Place, as I understand it. Uh, and the management plan, as I read it, indicated that uh, rubbish collection would be weekly. Is that appropriate for a 30-room hotel? I looked at the rubbish generation, but uh, particularly with the restaurant on site, is it envisaged that a weekly collection would be appropriate? Uh, well, I guess that, that's the plan that they have submitted, but do we... Uh, check that at all and for, or look at similar uses in the vicinity, even just the restaurant alone? Through the Chair, we've applied a condition requiring the submission of a waste management plan because the plan that is, is submitted and has been attached to the report doesn't reflect the City's preferred um, loading bay at the front of the premises and was based on there being a loading bay at the rear of the premises which is not supported by the city. As such they'll need to submit an amended waste management plan to demonstrate how they'll be able to achieve their waste collection and the rates for that um, to be collected from William Street. The rates in there, I, I'm not up to date with the frequency of such collections but I anticipate that they would, given the number of bins that they've shown in the waste management plan, they would require more frequent than once per week and um, it's intended that they would obtain private waste collection because the city wouldn't be able to service this scale of development. So that, that was the other thing, was if it's to be private waste collection, uh, well, I don't really see how we can, ha well, the, if it was to be private waste collection, does that mean the waste management plan can stipulate that the bins are to be brought out at the time that the vehicle is, arrives to collect rather than being left uh, outside to await the vehicle to come and collect? Is that something that is normally specified through the waste management plan? Through the chair, yes. So the um, requirements of the condition states that they detail the number of bins and the frequency of collection and where the bins would be collected from. And that's something that our waste team will consider when the plan comes in. Um, and we'll also tie that to the loading bay management plan to ensure that the various services that will be um, attending this site uh, don't conflict with each other. And we can also ensure that through that waste management plan that, yes, yeah, certainly they don't bring the waste out until collection is occurring, given there's not going to be anywhere to store it. Thank you. Um, just on the issue of bins, where is, uh, I'm trying to see the bin store area on the plans. Can you just point those out? On page 115, uh, <laughs> just behind the, on right at the rear of the site, I think it says bin store, I can't quite see. 
What does that so say? So further to that, can we get higher yeah. res plans provided in the briefing notes, please? Because these we can try um, to do that. We'll speak with the applicant to see if they can provide us with some better quality plans, so that when we put it into the agenda, it doesn't blur so much. But yeah, I believe that rear, um, where that door is at the very rear of the site, is the bin store. So just on that, if the plan is that the bins would need to be collected from the loading bays on um, on William, but the bin store is right at the back there, would that need to be reconfigured if that's going to be part of the waste management plan that the rubbish, that otherwise they're going to be taking bins out the back and um, I guess taking them um, on, on quite a journey through <laughs> through quite public places past um, past the uh, outdoor alfresco area up the laneway. Through the chair, yet yeah, that's something that we would try to manage through the waste management plan and it may be we'll have a chat to an appli the applicant before um, the council meeting to see if that's something that they would want to reconsider given the extent that they would have to pull them through. Thank you, Councillor Harley. Um, thank you. So I just want to clarify, um, and sorry if I'm repeating any of the questions that um, were asked. In regards to the parking, can I just clarify that there will be no parking on site, that there will be no disability parking on site, in brackets, is, park, is a, a disability parking required? And where will all the loading and unloading, laundry, food stuff, et cetera, et cetera, happen in addition to the waste collection? That's my first lot of questions. Um, the other question I had was in regards to, uh, um, I guess, the point that was made about there being enough parking in the area. I seriously beg to differ on that. But I'm just wanting to find out when that survey was done and what the information, like how was it collected? Was it done on a Friday, for example? Um, and uh, if we could see that information down to you know the count of how many bays um, are there, the turnover rate, etc. My third question is: Are you able to provide some comparisons with other hotels uh, within the city of Vincent? Um, a little, what's the name of the little street? Is it Howe Street in um, just off Newcastle Street? The the um, the that particular. Um, building and any other hotel sites within the city of Vincent and what we've required um, for parking and maybe even some other contrasting um, applications where we've required required parking for um, smaller type establishments um, you know where somebody's building six units and a range of things I'm just trying to get a bit of a context in regards to um, our understanding of <laughs> one type of application requiring parking and another type of application not requiring any parking. And I just want to see some comparison points because I'm just looking for some consistency. Through the chair. Okay, hopefully I remembered everything. First question It's was, all recorded just in okay. case. <laughs> in relation to the parking, I can confirm there are no bays proposed to be provided on site. There is no disability bay proposed to be required and we don't believe that one is required, but we can confirm this in the briefing notes. The loading and unloading of the laundry, again, would occur similar to um, just as described for the waste management. So the service bay loading management plan would need to cover off on all of the facilities that this site's going to need where um, someone will be coming and collecting things that would be collected from the loading bay. So for instance, the laundry, they'll need to specify when that's going to occur and the frequency of that occurring so that that can be captured in that management plan. We can look to provide some comparison. We have recently looked into other hotels operating in Vincent and approvals for these. And the one that you mentioned, um, I think it's called Little Sparrow or something bird related. That uh, was approved under the East Perth Redevelopment Authority scheme and that was in the Perth parking management area, which doesn't require any on-site parking to be provided. It simply provides a maximum rate of parking. So I'm not sure that that's going to be a reasonable comparison. That was the only other hotel we were able to find that we have an approval for. And we can, in the, pre in the briefing notes, provide some commentary perhaps about contrasting uses and the, the requirement to provide 
parking for different types of uses and what generates that. Oh, the parking survey, that is provided on pages 173 and 174 of your agenda and that was undertaken on Saturday the 15th of September and Thursday the 20th of September. So um, my question, um, sorry then in regards to that, is um, on the plans, so you, you um, sorry, I just want to phrase this properly as a question. You're asking for um, details in regards to the loading, unloading, laundry, etc. So, and you're, uh, do we have the ability to control what times that occurs? And I'm asking that because there don't doesn't look like there'll be room for a turning circle. Therefore, they'll be reversing out onto Brisbane Place, and all under law, all those trucks are required to have very loud. Um, beeping, um, um, beeping um, noises, and that my other question is: Is there can there be some consideration to going and doing a parking survey on a Friday around that particular area? And I ask that because we've had significant long-term parking issues raised with us um, around that area on a Friday by residents and businesses, and that's because the mosque is in use. Through the chair. Uh, yes, the parking man the sorry, the service bay delivery plan can um, is intended to try and manage those hours of delivery so that it's not within um, outside of the seven to seven, so that we can mitigate any potential noise impacts to those surrounding properties. In regards to a parking survey, we can um, go back to the applicant and see if that could be undertaken. It wouldn't be able to be undertaken probably before council next week but it may be able to be conditioned if council accepted that. Well, I can't comment until next week, I guess, but I guess my question, my question is about whether we as a council are satisfied that the parking surveys presented, which interestingly exclude Friday, which is the one day of the week when we get the most amount of complaints in my, in my um, anecdotal surveys myself. Um, so is that satisfactory? to the administration and I guess the question remains, is it satisfactory to council? Through the chair, what we may be able to provide um, before the council meeting is through the um, transport strategy that's been undertaken at the moment. The um, consultant has done a, review, a survey of all of our parking areas and we can see if there's any data relating to Fridays in that area. We could talk to the Director of Community Engagement who has met with the mosque recently and then well we met maybe eight months ago and made some parking changes in relation to the pressures around prayer time in the area. So who was next? Councillor Toppelberg. Sorry, just to make sure that we do get some information in relation uh, to the proposed to uh, how the traffic management or the um, vehicular access may be impacted by the two way change on William Street. I know it's not contemplated at all in the report, but on paper that's a significant change that will happen. Uh, so just it, obviously parking and access becomes quite different when there's only one lane uh, available. And if there's any proposed changes, I know that further up on Brisbane Street there is some changes to the intersection. If that involves the removal of any uh, car parking bays, I think we have to widen the intersection to accommodate turning circle. But if we can just get some information as to any direct impacts and likely traffic impacts, thank you. Yep, through the chair, we will be able to provide that through the briefing notes. Councillor Gonczewski. Back on parking. Um, just in terms of the um, documentation that's been provided, I note that there's a traffic and uh, parking demand assessment. Um, uh, however, it uh, has and, and that there is a requirement for a parking management plan to address the use of the loading bay. Has there been any consideration given to a parking management plan in relation to, say, the 28 staff that could be on site at any one time, um, or the, um, I guess, the, the hotel guests in relation to where they may be directed to park, um, so as, as to ensure that they that those 128 people that could be on site at any one time um, place zero demand on parking in the public realm, um, which would be what would be required for there to be no um, recommended cash in lieu. No, that's the, I would assess that as being a donation, but that's um, essentially for next week. 
through the chair, our intention um, prior to the council meeting was to review that parking management and conditioning in um, number five at the moment to incorporate a requirement for information to be provided to guests staying at the hotel regarding the public parking facilities in proximity to the site and clearly stating that there is no on-site parking available and alternative measures for that and also requesting that they provide to us information as to how they'll communicate and educate their staff about the um, absence of on-site parking. Councillor Vitakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, through you, Mayor, um, I think the parking's going to be um, quite a... Um, I don't think there's going to be a councillor here that won't ask a question about the parking. I actually concur with Councillor Harley. I mean, I think that that area is already at times at Councilor capacity. Councillor Vitakis, so, are you asking a question? Yeah, I am. I am. Um, so, but I'm yeah, taking the long way. But we're not looking um, looking at the um, assessments that were done, um, taking into account that it was September last year. Have we got data? Because there, there are a huge amount of vacancies in that area. Um, have we got data to actually compare against when we actually had um, a lot more businesses in fu uh, functioning in there, which I can see that in the future as the economy changes, we're going to get a different cycle. So we're able to actually go back and actually have a look at some of those um, assessments that have been done to get an idea about really what that parking capacity is. I agree with Councillor um, Harley. We need to actually, I would like to actually see what some of those figures are um, on a... Friday. I also want to ask if the discussions have been made with the applicant about, and it's not just educating uh, their staff and their residents, uh, their um, guests about parking, but any discussions with some of the private operators to take out um, a lease um, to actually um, guarantee that there are a certain number of bays, whether there are 15 or 20 bays that are set aside for use of their staff or their, or their customers. through the chair, we can come back to you with some information in the briefing notes um, regarding uh, parking vacancy rates in those areas previously and also in relation to um, discussion for staff parking being leased from another operator. So many hands in the air. Go Councillor Gonczewski. This is just following on from Councillor Vitakis. Is it um, a valid plan and condition to like, require reciprocal parking arrangements be put in place? Through the chair, our um, parking policy does c contemplate reciprocal parking, but you would have to have a legal agreement in place prior to us being to the approval being issued. It couldn't be a condition of approval. Who was next, Councillor Topperberg? Were you asking? Uh, just a question, because uh, if you are able to liaise, please, with the applicant between now and next week, and see how wedded they are to the commercial tenancy proposed, um, and whether that could potentially, that space could potentially provide um, a loading bay slash acrod bay of some description on site. I know it forms part of the application, but it's also an at grade um, significant amount of space, um, which doesn't interfere with the. Um, the restaurant or the hotel, specifically it's a separate use, so just uh, whether that is critical to the application and whether it could potentially be conditioned for that to be provided as um, uh, parking or access of some description. Councillor Harley. I um, just want to, um, my questions relate to deliveries again and just um, having a look at page 149 um, of, the, um, of the proposal. So. And this relates to what information went out um, for consultation, uh, particularly for the residents in that area. So, for example, um, at this stage, on every day of the week except Sunday, there will be some form of delivery or, or takeaway. And at this stage, that's four days of supplies, at least two days of laundry, one day of waste, but it's been raised tonight, that that doesn't, may not seem like enough. So we're looking at a six day a week delivery cycle, delivery or pickup cycle, um, and all bit between set hours and then plus um, any maintenance. So I just want, would like, um, if you could please send out the information um, as that was used in the consultation, because this is, this is here in the report, but what did everyone else get in terms of the information we were asking them to comment on and did that information clearly articulate 
that there would be an intensity of use relating to deliveries um, which were backing out onto residential um, properties. Through the chair, we can provide some information in the briefing notes about that, what was um, circulated during the advertising, which I believe was undertaken in November. Sorry, can I just clarify that the um, officer recommendation means that there'll be no access from Brisbane Place for any of these services that would all occur at William Street? So it's not a residential street that the intended pickup or all of these services would take place from? That's correct. I think there's some questions around whether administration is confident that all of the services that need to access the hotel can be catered for in the public realm as, as suggested um, on William Street and the configuration of where the waste store is currently does cause um, some questions around that. Um, I also just wanted to ask a question about um, the neighbouring property being the Perth Mosque which is heritage listed. Has that um, been factored into considerations around any higher order requirement of construction management, for example? Through the chair, I believe the building that's heritage listed is not the one immediately abutting the site. It's the one, um, the mosque sits over multiple parcels, so it's not immediately abutting. In any case, there is a condition requiring construction management plan which can require a dilapidation report be prepared for that site um, depending on the construction measures proposed. Given that they're not proposing a basement with piling, it may not create too much of an impact. Thank you. Councillor Fatakis. Um, it's just a, through me, just a question regarding um, the waste management plan and uh, collection of bins. Um, can, uh, in our discussions with, um, with the applicant, uh, has there ever been any consideration given to on-site bin collection, um, especially now with um, a number of um, local providers having the very small um, collection trucks which allow them to actually go on-site onto smaller developments and strata developments? Through the Chair, um, administration's preference is that there is no access to Brisbane Place to avoid conflicts with those existing residential properties at the rear. Ideally, the preference and the recommendation is the report is that all servicing is done from William Street, which would preclude, while waste collection would occur at the site, it wouldn't be within the property boundary. It would still need the bin to be brought out to the street for that collection to occur. Councillors, any further questions on this item? Okay, we'll move on. Given that we've addressed all of the matters that were raised by members of the public gallery this evening, I'll go back to the beginning of the agenda and work through those items that we haven't yet asked questions on. So we'll go to 5.1, which is number 1 of 281 and 2 of 281 Vincent Street, Leadville. Proposed change of use from home office to office. Any questions on this item? Councillor Fatakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, just some clarification on the um, works that are being proposed. Um, so it's a question relating to um, two home office uh, lots which are, um, have been advertised as two bedroom, two bathroom apartments, each with one car bay. So I know that there were a different reference in the report to the amount of car bays, but each of those lots, lot number one and lot number two over time, have been advertised separately, each providing one car bay. Um, there seems to be an apartment located above, so I'm trying to actually just get an understanding whether the application is just for the ground floor component to be combined into one area, and what does that mean for the residences above, um, and what does that mean with regards to um, the parking bays, because essentially if that's the case, I see it that we've got uh, two home offices uh, that are now being um, essentially turned into three three separate uses, um, two apartments and, and one commercial. So I just want to get an understanding of exactly what's being proposed and what will, what will be left behind um, in addition to that ground floor area that we're not considering. 
through the chair. What may be useful, and we can provide you the link to it in the briefing notes, is the previous council decision on this from 2012, which was the approval of the development. And what that showed was these two ground floor tenancies being linked to the apartments above. So when the strata's gone through, there are two uh, units, one and two, the residential <laughs> component above, have these ground floor portions allocated to them in the strata plan. And the approval showed that those ground floor portions was for home office. There was no parking associated with them. There's just a parking bay associated with the residential unit. So that remains unchanged. The parking bay is still tied to the residential unit above. And these ground floor tenancies are still also tied to those units one and two. What the application is proposing is to remove that internal wall that's shown there and to create one larger tenancy for the purpose of an office which could then be externally leased to someone. At the moment, the home office definition limits it to only being used by the occupant of that dwelling, which would be those dwellings above there. So the intention is to create one office space that's still strated down the middle, effectively where that wall is currently shown, um, but for use as one, to be able to uh, lease as one tenancy because the um, existing owners aren't using those spaces. Thank you, Mayor. That's exactly as um, I saw it, but essentially we're still dealing with two separate strata lots, lot one and lot two. So we'd, we've actually got the um, emerging as such for the usage of a ground floor area, which in, in, um, was still approved originally uh, as an area, one area is part of lot one, and the separate ground floor area is actually part of the legal lot part two. So when considering this, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to actually understand how we can consider within a strata development, and, and again, we've got um, an application within a strata development. also want to understand what consultation's been done with um, the strata company and the other owners, um, because um, we've got a a different consideration with regards to um, to parking and impact on that on that as well. So, um, has this actually this sort of application has this actually been um, done and uh, before in Vincent? Where we've essentially got a, a splitting of one part of a lot and splitting of another part of a strata lot and merging together to create um, a separate use and an additional use within what was originally entertained um, when it was approved in 2012. Through the chair, I couldn't say specifically of another application off the top of my head, but it's certainly not uncommon for multiple um, tenancy owners to get together and decide to either amalgamate their use or convert a number of the uses from what had previously been approved. And certainly the case that um, I can recall a building on William Street that's had multiple applications come in now to convert different levels from office to educational establishment and combined areas together for use by different operators. Um, and the application has been applied for by both number one and number two, those unit owners, and they have both signed the application form to consent to the change of that. Physically, their ownership doesn't change and in, amongst themselves they'll need to come to an agreement about how they might want to reinstate that wall if if um, either party ever sells, that will be a requirement for them, um, given the way that the strata has been prepared. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, so with this approval being for Lot 1 and Lot 2 at 281 Vincent Street, um, but we're really at the moment we're only talking about part of Lot 1 and part of Lot 2. So when we actually get a change of use, how does that actually relate back to the parts of the lot that are actually located above this commercial um, um, area or, or this area that was designated for, for home, for office use? Um, what does that actually mean for the actual approved use of the area above it? Through the chair, I forgot to answer your previous question that um, all tenancies were advertised to and surrounding properties as shown on page 13 were also advertised to. In relation to what 
impacts occur to the upper floor, there would be no change. So the approval and that condition, that 1.1, um, says it relates to the plans as shown in the attachment, and those plans only relate to the ground floor tenancy. There's no proposed changes to the upper floor, so if there was ever any query from anyone about what the upper floor approval is related to, we would revert back or refer back to the original approval, which still remains valid over those portions because they're not shown in the approved plans. And they specifically stated home office on those previous plans and that this, if approved, this, these plans will supersede those plans. Councillors, Councillor Gonczewski. Um, in, uh, uh, now we have to scroll back. Recommendation, it's one of the conditions number two in relation to the interactive frontage. It says Lord Street and I think it should say Vincent Street. I don't know if there was a replacement page issued. If there was, I'm sorry I missed it. Through the chair we will be amending that before the agenda goes out. Thank you. And just in relation to our discussion about strata previously, I'm possibly going down a rabbit hole. So just to confirm, there's no common property issues here in relation to parking or accessible toilets that were raised, etc., that could create um, the need or some requirement for further discussion or approval with the strata? Through the chair, no, the approval relates only to those tenancies, Unit 1 and Unit 2, and internal alterations to those tenancies and doesn't require the approval of the strata. Um, I have a question about the parking. I'm just wondering why this, um, why the, the home offices didn't have a parking allocation. Is it because it was tied to um, their residential development? So the residential unit being tied to the home office? Through the chair, yes, because the home office was approved with the um, residential unit, then it was only subject to those residential parking requirements. And I believe the definition of home office mentions no additional parking being required as a, as a means of being able to fit within that definition. Um, is that something that we need to be aware of as a, as a um, city, just in relation to people putting in a home office and not being required to um, provide parking and then the change of use coming to then change to office where parking would be required? Just um, in terms of, I guess, the overall allocation of parking within that building, would those um, residential um, units have received additional car parking because they had a home office attached or would they have received the same amount of parking as a, um, a residential unit without a home office? Through the chair, they only had one bay allocated based on the residential um, parking requirements. I believe home office is exempt under the scheme regulations, so wouldn't trigger an application if someone wanted to operate there because the definition of home office is so that it doesn't result in um, impacts to the surrounding of many and there's no further intensification and it's not intended to result in customers coming to the site. If someone wanted to go, for instance, to run a hairdresser's from their premises, then that would be a different land use and would require an application and parking to be provided for that. Okay, councillors. All right, thank you. We'll move on to item 5.3, which is 194 to 196 car place leadable, proposed change of use to unlisted use, unauthorised existing development site yard. Councillor Gontrzewski. So um, with, in relation to parking, the, um, the parking management plan that was provided is that more of a parking assessment and demand assessment? It is. I'm just having a look. It's, um, can I just confirm that um, the workers that will be attending the building site will be accessing that site through this block and reporting to that building site through via car place, um, and that it's proposed that there'll be, uh, I think it was 10 bays provided on site, but there could be up to 50 people on site at any one time, is that correct? Through the chair, yes that's correct. They're proposing 10 on-site bays, or well, they have existing 10 on-site bays and an average of 35 staff with a maximum of 50 staff. I don't know that they necessarily meet at that site first and then 
attend to their various jobs on the site, but that's certainly something that we can check um, before next week and seek some clarification on. Um, I believe the intention would be, and the advice to their staff that have been operating out there for the last year, is that there is limited availability parking on site and that alternative arrangements would need to be made. And yes, I do accept that the parking management plan provided is more just a um, this is what we have as opposed to this is what's available. Um, look, I, I recognise that there is a construction management plan for the building site that requires, that states that there is no that staff will park in um, the City of Vincent public car parks. Um, but I'd just like to request a, um, uh, an amendment in relation to the condition around the parking management plan just to um, perhaps provide some reinforcement within this approval around um, staff to park in, um, to be instruct will be instructed um, to park in, um, I guess not on residential streets and um, and also potentially around um, notification to surrounding residents on um, uh, on uh, car place um, as to who they can contact the site supervisor phone number for example so they can contact them in addition to reporting to rangers if it appears that that parking management plan and the instruction is not being adhered to we can provide that through the briefing notes Councillors, any further questions on 5.3? Okay, thank you. That um, Just to note that 5.8, um, which was number three, Alma Road, has been withdrawn. So that concludes question and answer on development services items for the evening. Um, we don't have any engineering items this evening. Sorry, it still says engineering here, CEO. <laughs> um, so we'll move on to corporate services. 7.1 investment report as at 28th of February 2019. <coughs> no questions? Um, authorisation of expenditure, sorry, 7.2, authorisation of expenditure for the period 1st to 28th of February 2019. Any questions? Um, late report financial statements as at 28th of February 2019. Okay, I'm going to pause here and ask a question. I just want to talk about capital expenditure, underspend, how are we tracking? It says here that we have 71.6% uh, of our capital um, budget to go and we have four months of the um, financial year remaining based on this being a report of the 28th of February. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, through the mid-year review process, um, we did uh, question all of the capital expenditure to date and have been told that um, all capital expenditure that was included in the mid-year uh, revised figures will be used within this financial year. So we'll get there. Is that the answer in, in short? I'm partly answering on behalf of the Director of Infrastructure and Environment, um, but Would yes, like we've to been told that that will be the case. Director of Infrastructure and Environment. Yeah, through you, Michael. Obviously, the report's uh, behind time. When you uh, look at the report, I, I mean, I looked at it um, earlier today, and it says, for example, some projects haven't started or they've started not finished. We're already a month behind. Some of those projects have now started and some have finished. So I know there's a lot more money spent than is shown in the report. I also think the report doesn't reflect some of the changes made at mid-year review. So uh, some of the projects that uh, have been scaled back or will be moved to next year have been dropped off the program, but they still appear. So, um, so I think the picture is much better than shown in the report. And certainly the staff are trying very hard to, to get the projects done by the end of this financial year. Thank you. Any further questions on 7.3? No? Okay, 7.4. Amendments to the Trading in Public Places Local Law 2008 and the Local Government Property Local Law 2008. Councillor Gonshevsky. Um, hold on. So in section 5.11 of the I think it's the property local law, it specifies that the dimension of an awning, balcony or veranda must be a minimum distance of 600 millimetres from the face of the kerb and this has been changed from 500 millimetres from the kerb, which I'm presuming is probably around the same distance 
in real life. Uh, but I was just wondering if there are any existing approvals that couldn't meet this new provision or whether the existing approvals that would continue to apply and then this law would just be related to new approvals and whether that needs to be reflected anywhere. If so, and I'm very happy for that detailed question to be taken on notice. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we'll need to take that question on notice. Thank you. Councillors. Um, I just wanted to ask a few questions uh, in relation to the, um, the changes to some of the um, penalties on page six of the report. Um, I just wanted to ask whether there'd been any consideration of in including, um, or maybe this is, when we talk about change rooms in a pool premises, library or other community facility, um, are we also referring to public toilets? This is about um, using a mobile phone camera or other recording device. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we were, I think, including um, any public toilets as a community facility. So just to, just to um, I think that in the local law it talks about Beatty Park, it talks about an administration centre, etc. So I just wanted to double check that this would include any toilet facility within the City of Vincent at a reserve, for example, that hasn't specifically been mentioned in the local law? We have amended some of the definitions to make it broader, so it was talking about public toilets generally. That was our intention. Okay, thank you. Um, and also I just wanted to ask about the um, use of um, failure to obtain a permit to use local government property or a community facility for a for-profit purpose. Is this specifically looking at group fitness? And I'm just make, wanting to make sure that we don't sort of unwittingly, or that we don't catch someone who sort of thinks they're doing the right thing and then we go after them for a $500 penalty. Like how would this actually work in liaison with any small group fitness classes that might pop up without really realising what the rules are? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, the intention is to really assist rangers in their, in their current practice. The current practice is indeed to respond to any complaints from the community and for rangers to attend, simply advise a, a group fitness business that they are required to obtain a permit and then link them up with our community partnerships team to enable that to happen. Um, at the moment, um, if a commercial operator refuses to obtain a permit and continues to use our open spaces for a um, profit, uh, there is limited capacity for rangers to, there's limited big stick I suppose for rangers to actually bring that to a head. So that is the intention of amending the clause and including the proposed penalty. The city's current approach in terms of really just redirecting um, those group fitness instructors or businesses to obtain a permit is still the preferred approach and that will continue regardless of any change to the local law. Okay, so this is after they've been given warning and they're being repeat offenders. Okay. I um, also had a question in relation to um, page 68 of the agenda. It talks about use of outdoor eating area by public and two point, oh, I think it's 2.21 now, 2.21, clause 1. A person shall not occupy a chair or otherwise use the furniture in an outdoor eating area of the subject of a permit unless the person uses the chair or furniture for the purpose of consuming food or drinks provided by the permit holder of the outdoor eating area. I guess I'm just questioning whether that's necessary. There is a clause that says a person shall leave an outdoor eating area where requested to do so by the permit holder. Um, but if the person is sitting in a chair in an alfresco area and it's not bothering the um, person who holds a permit, does the local law need to stipulate that they can't be there unless they're eating or drinking? I'm just wondering whether it's necessary given that clause 22.212 says the person can must leave if they're requested to do so by the permit holder. Through you, Mayor Cole, we'll have to take that question on notice. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, moving on from corporate services to community engagement, one item, 8.1, the Draft City of Vincent Innovate Reconciliation Action Plan 2019-2021. Other questions?
No questions? I had tagged a few pages, so I just want to see if I had a question. Um, CEO's asked if um, the photo of us doing the emu dance should be included. I think that's a wonderful <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> um, no questions, we'll move on. Um, next item is 9.1, the information bulletin. Are there any questions on this item? Okay, then we're moving to item 10.1. I note that Councillor Tobelberg has left the meeting. Um, is he still here? No, he's left. Okay. 10.1, late report, notice of motion, Councillor Joshua Toppleberg, tender or quotations for bulk verge collection. Questions on this item? Councillor Toppleberg. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Layden. <laughs> You're always getting confused with other council members. Indeed. Indeed. At least it wasn't Councillor Gontoshevsky this time anyway. Um, a couple of questions. Um, firstly, what is the total cost of our current bog verge collection annually? Through you, Michael, if I can take that notice on uh, that question on notice, I'll uh, put something out with the briefing notes. I understand a number of councils within the MRC have also followed this route of um, getting rid of uh, the bog verge collection. Um, are you able to advise which councils they were and what they then replaced it with? Yep, through you, Michael. The councils are aware of an MRC that have replaced traditional bulk with uh, what's known as on demand or on request services are City of Stirling that uh, offer a skip service and some on demand items, and City of Joondalup uh, do a similar thing with a skip and some items that are on demand. And uh, for those councils, are you able to advise how, uh, what percentage reduction in waste production they had as a result of it, and also what, um, with making that change, and also what was the reduction in costs that was achieved as well? Um, through you, Michael, uh, I think I'll take that question on notice, and uh, we'll put something in the briefing notes. Um, and also for the benefit of other councillors, uh, is the director able to explain what happens in terms of the overall picture for MRC given the fixed cost that the MRC experiences and the variable income streams they have based on waste input? So if we were to reduce the total amount of waste, what would be the resultant impact for MRC and other councils as well? Yep, through you, Michael. So as reduced waste, uh, as the amount of waste that we send to MRC reduces, the cost per ton goes up because of those fixed costs. And uh, we have some demonstration figures that I can um, put in the briefing notes as well to say what that would look like. Councillors. Um, Director, I just want to ask you, um, it seems to be that administration supports, it says the intent of the notice of motion. So I just want to ask, in terms of under our waste strategy, it talks about administration doing an options appraisal of bulk waste collection. Um, are you um, comfortable with meeting the um, report to council by no later than June 2019? Does that fit within the scope of works within the waste strategy? Um, because I think that's really um, the main thing here and that um, that could be different to what was proposed in the waste strategy. It really just looks like it's a time frame thing, a time, timing issue and whether you're comfortable with that. Through you, Michael. Um, yeah, we're absolutely comfortable that we will bring the options to council uh, before June. Great. Any other questions, Councillor Murphy? Um, I did want to put in a, just a special request <clears throat> um, because I note that you um, mentioned that there was environmental benefits to uh, an alternative. Um, it would be great if, if at all possible, to include. Um, uh, an assessment of also the impacts, uh, economic impacts, socio-economic impacts, um, social impacts, cultural impacts, um, and any other impact beyond environment that um, could be considered in that assessment, please, if you're agreeable, that is. Through you, Michael. Uh, I certainly agree. We'll do what we can to include those impacts. 
Well, so just to ask another question, some of these changes that we're making, um, potentially making in waste, if we look at FOGO, big changes at the doorstep, um, what capacity will there be um, for consultation with the community about um, options that will be presented to Council? Um, again, through you, Nicole, I think um, the process we'll follow is similar to what we did with FOGO, which to bring you the options, uh, that was options for intercepting um, organic waste. This will be options around the different styles of bulk waste service, including an option not to do it and an option to carry on as we are. Uh, then based on your preferred options, which is what we did with FOGO, then we'll undertake consultation based on that. Um, okay, well if there was an option not to make any change, um, I'm, I'm just wanting to ask whether there's any issue with not proceeding for a tender or quotations for bulk verge collection beyond the existing contract. Is that an issue? Uh, through you, Nicole, we've just completed the, this year's um, bulk waste service. Um, so we do one a year. This is junk bulk. Um, if we would have a decision, for example, in June to carry on as we are, then we would have time to go out back up to tender and have another bulk waste collection this time next year. So that wouldn't be a problem. Thank you, Director. Any final questions? Okay. Um, we do have one confidential item um, for this evening, so um, we will say thank you to those who've joined us on the live stream and we will move behind closed doors, so thank you everyone.